Well, uh, good evening, everyone. My name is uh, Professor Andy Nesbitt. I'm the, the current head of the Department of Medical Physics and Biomedical Engineering, uh, and I'm delighted to welcome you to uh, Professor Munro's uh, inaugural uh, lecture. Uh, I'm delighted that so many of Peter's family and friends have been able to, to join us today, especially considering in many cases it is, you've literally travelled halfway around the world. Uh, and I'm also delighted to see uh, so many of Peter's uh, colleagues past and, and present, uh, including, I believe, Peter, Professor Peter Torok, um, Peter's uh, PhD supervisor. Um, I'd just like to read a, a, a professorial citation, um, essentially taking some of the highlights from the... Uh, um, the um, uh, when Peter was awarded his, his professorship. So Peter was appointed a Professor of Computational Optics on the 1st of October 2022 in recognition of his outstanding world-leading contributions to biomedical optics. Professor Munro uh, co-founded the thriving Coherent Optics Research Group in the department, which under Professor Munro's leadership now has a, a worldwide network of scientists and clinician research collaborators. As an example of his world-leading research, Professor Munro reported the first demonstration of laboratory-based quantitative X-ray phase imaging and developed the theoretical foundations for the technique, uh, of which I'm sure we'll, we'll hear more shortly. Uh, Professor Munro's uh, global reputation is reflected in his many uh, invitations to pretend, present at major international conferences, his participation on scientific program committees and numerous requests to review for major international journals uh, and grant uh, awarding councils. Professor Munro uh, has also been very successful in obtaining uh, grant funding. He has held uh, funded research fellowships continuously since February 2015, uh, currently holding a Royal Society University Research Fellowship. He has obtained research grants worth over £2 million as principal investigator and over £16 million as co-investigator. Uh, Professor Munro has also uh, published approximately uh, 90 uh, peer-reviewed papers. However, it's not just in research uh, that Professor Munro excels. His contributions to institutional life at UCL, UCL are significant. Uh, and I've included being the departmental director of research, and he is currently the, the vice dean research for research for the, the faculty of, of engineering sciences, uh, the largest faculty <coughs> at UCL. So it is my uh, absolute pleasure to invite Professor Munro to deliver his inaugural lecture. Right, well, thank you, Andy, for that very kind introduction. And thank you to everybody here um, for, for being here today. I will do proper um, thank yous at the end of the talk. Um, but before I, wanted, before I start, I did want to thank um, those that have travelled, you know, a particularly long way to be here today, um, those that have also travelled the journey with me um, to get to this point today. Because, um, I, yeah, I really appreciate it. And, um, and I've already mentioned um, to one or two people that I've got, no, I don't have any equations in the talk today, which met with disappointment, I'll, I'll hasten to add. But I hope for the majority of you that it's, that's a positive thing. Um, and I'll try just to explain a bit about what I've been doing, um, why I think it's exciting, and what I hope to do. So, if... Now, this was working earlier. We might have to go to the... Right. The first problem. <laughs> it's a Microsoft-related issue. This PowerPoint has managed... This, this is not the first issue that I've had with PowerPoint. On this... this my, my presentation got corrupted two weeks ago in such a bad way that even the backup um, was, was corrupted. So 
Let's hope don't have any such issues. There we go. Okay, so as a start, just to give you a little bit of background, so I started out, well, I grew up in Perth, Western Australia, studied um, electrical engineering and computer science at the University of Western Australia. Um, I think, I mean, I, do, I didn't really, I didn't know exactly what I was going to do, but me, most, the majority of people that study engineering in Perth go on to work in the mining industry, because Perth is essentially a city that's um, surrounded by vast quantities of iron ore and, and other elements. Uh, but when I got to the end of my degree, I decided that that's not what I wanted to do. So I went and worked in um, the T Telstra Research Labs. Um, with Telstra is Australia's principal um, telecommunications company. And I was quite interested just, just to reflect on this because at, at this stage, Telstra was... Um, if I can... No, that's not going to work. Telstra was 51% government-owned, 49% privately owned, and my, my view of it was that they had the worst of both worlds. Um, and, but they're doing pretty well because actually their share price is nearly more than half of what it was then. So, but I wasn't there all that long um, before I decided actually, because I, I, I was pretty sure I wanted to, to do a PhD, but I just wanted to make sure. Um, and it became evident pretty quickly that I did and so I started applying for scholarships, and I was fortunate enough to be offered a Commonwealth scholarship, um, which is a scheme that no longer exists. But it took me to Imperial College um, and to work with Peter, who's in the audience here today. And I will say a little bit more, um, obviously, about, about what we did. But the, the idea of the project, and of course the, the thesis title will make sense only really to specialists in the field, but the idea was to build a microscope in a computer. And actually, um, it really was... So before I really knew how any of this worked, um, it really was Peter's idea. I actually saw this was in the early days of the internet, and I saw he was looking for someone to sort of do this, and I thought, yes, that is a project that I want to do. Um, so I, yes, was very blessed in getting the funding, and I... Essentially, my project was about how do we develop software that simulates this arrangement of lenses, sample, and lenses, which is a microscope. Now, I just thought I'd give you an idea of why this is interesting. Now, I've only um, very recently gotten into um, retinal imaging, and I'm, I'm still very much on the periphery of it, but... I found out that in the UK, every day, 250 people start to lose their sight. Um, and the ability to do better imaging will en enhance our ability to diagnose that earlier and to, to take um, corrective action earlier. Um, and so imaging is a really important part of diagnosing retinal and, and, and other eye-related diseases. And this, I will talk a little bit more about what this type of imaging is. This is optical coherence tomography. Um, and this is imaging a slice through the retina. So it's actually, we're, we're pretty much looking at this part of, of the retina. Um, and ophthalmologists have developed a system of naming these different um, band structures. And band two is of, is of particular interest and is been pointed out to me by um, a collaborator that we, we don't know, so when an ophthalmologist looks at this image, they actually don't know which part of the retina it relates to. So you, you don't need to know exactly what all this is, but the point is that this is what's called the outer segment of the retina, this is called the inner segment, and so this band here could relate to this um, junction here, or it could relate to this. This is called the ellipsoid, and within the ellipsoid, there are mitochondria. Mitochondria are just um, components of a cell that generate energy. And so, we don't, there, there's no clear consensus as to whether, whether that band relates to this or this. Now, the re, one of the reasons why this is tricky is in ophthalmology, you um, can't biopsy someone's retina. So in other areas of medicine, you can do some, you can 
perform an invasive um, technique, but with, with the eye, because it's so fragile, we, we just can't do that. So, and there are very good reasons for wanting to understand the relationship of the image to the retina. So, um, there's a role here for computation because we can actually, we can develop a model to simulate this um, and in order to understand this in a way that we can't do experimentally. So, now, moving on to imaging. 95%, I reckon, of what you need to know about imaging can be understood through this example of dropping a stone in a pond, okay? Because imaging with waves is all about detecting a wave and understanding or reconstructing where that wave came from. Okay, so I'll just thank my, my two collaborators here who helped to, to produce these demonstrations. Um, the interest did wear off um, a little bit faster than I was hoping. Because when we do imaging, because if, if in this example, if we time reverse the wave, if we can reverse the wave, then we can trace back to where, to where that stone actually hit the pond. Okay, so that's a pretty like, easy example. So how does that relate to imaging? So here's an example. This is, these are not images that I've acquired, but these are images from the literature of photoreceptors. Photoreceptors convert light into an electrical signal that the brain uses to interpret in, in order for us to see. Now, if we think about imaging a photoreceptor, what a photoreceptor, this is, it is, it is quite simplified, but a photoreceptor will reflect off, so we shine light into the eye, and a photoreceptor will reflect light back out of the eye, okay? So think about the photoreceptor as a source of light that gives off a wave in a very similar way to the way that the stone gave off a wave in the pond. Now, the problem is that the photoreceptor is, in, is inside the eye. And so we've got this problem of now we don't have, whereas in the pond we had the wave going in all directions, now we've only got the wave going this way and the wave has to go, has to make it outside the pupil of the eye. That's the pupil. And that's, um, yeah, so it has to make, it has to make it outside of the pupil. And so this is a very simplified um, system. I know Marinko is somewhere here. If we went into his lab, we would, have a, we would be able to see a real system like this um, where but essentially you have the photoreceptor giving off light. This is the lens of the eye itself, right? And then we need another lens to, to focus that light. Now, what essentially I want you to recognize is that this construction of lenses is essentially doing the same thing as time revert, very, very similar thing to time reversal um, of the wave, okay? Because if you look over here, you have the wave now converging to, to a spot, okay? So the lenses are essentially doing this, the same thing as the time reversal, but there's one really important aspect, uh, one really important difference, and that is that we can't capture the entire wave. We can only capture a, a small um, fraction of the wave because it all has to go through the pupil of the eye. Now, it brings us to a concept of resolution. Um, I apologize to those of you for whom this is sort of second nature, but basically, when, so when we collect that light coming out of the eye, the wider the pupil, or the narrower the pupil, the larger the spot that it focuses down to, okay? So for the highest, for the best resolution, we need to make this incredibly wide, and so the light would almost approach coming in like that. Um, and resolution is important because when we have two of these spots that are very close to each other, they might combine, well, when they combine, we won't be able, so here there's two spots, so this, these could be generated by two closely spaced photoreceptors. 
but if the resolution is too low, then these spots will be too big so that when they overlap with each other, all we see is a single, is, is a single photoreceptor. So re resolution is, we're always trying to get better, res better resolution. But that's not the only problem because the other problem is that very often we have to image through, we have to image something that is deep down in the retina itself. And this, if we think about the pond analogy, if, when we have like reeds in the pond, um, if, we, if, we look at, if we drop the stone in and we look at the waves out here, the waves are very jumbled. Okay? But we can time reverse those waves uh, because we actually know what's there. You know, we, we, we know exactly where the reeds are. But in the eye, we, and I'll give you an example of this, we, we don't know. So in a, this is a very crude example, but here we might have a photoreceptor that's reflecting light. But on top of the photoreceptor, we might have some cells which distort the light. And, and this, this does create a problem, and I'll, I'll show you why. This is a simulation. There's a point source of light here, and it generates a pulse. So this is very much like the wave that is generated by the stone in the pond. Okay? So it propagates out to here. This lens, this lens um, captures that wave, and that wave is then refocused on the other side. And th this is just a time, this is as, as the wave would propagate in time. And what we see is Essentially, it's focused back down um, nicely to a, to a spot. But we can do something else where we can add in something like a cell, and we see how the cells lead to scattering of, of the light. But I've done something here where I've mirrored the arrangement of the cells on that side. And so what we see is that when we focus that light back down, because essentially light is just retracing the steps that it came through. Okay? So what we see is that the light is focused again. So this is a little bit like saying, well, yes, the, the light that left this point was jumbled by these cells, but because we know what was there, then we can account for that and reconstruct it anyway. The problem is when we're imaging in the eye, we generally don't know that. And so if I do the same, back, like the same propagation without these cells, what we see is that the light is spread out all over the place. And so that's what we call an aberrated image. Um, and that, that is you know, precisely the reason why if, if, you, if, if you put anything that's um, like, if let's say you have a swimming pool um, during the day and it's a bit windy, you can't see very well lines on the bottom of the pool. It's exactly the same phenomenon. So imaging through tissue causes aberrations. And one of the things that, we've, that I've been working on is to use, um, to use computation to correct or at least understand this aberration. So the motivation for developing this microscope in a computer um, is that, so I've, I've tried to demonstrate that the images are not always directly related to the sample or object of interest. There are, there are a lot of things, and actually many things I haven't gone into, um, that distort an image. But if we do have a model that, is, that realistically simulates light propagation, it, will, it gives us a way to interpret images and also gives us a way to, to develop and design new um, imaging systems. So that brings us on to um, the software that was actually only released in 2023, and I've called it Time Domain Maxwell Solver, but we started it in 2002. Um, for the benefit of my kids, that's me there. Um, that's Peter, and this is Manolis. So Manolis told me, uh, taught me a lot about the particular um, Maxwell Solver. Um, which, yeah, I mean, I won't go into the full details of, of, of that. 
Um, and it's, I don't know, I mean, I don't really know if this is a big program or not. It's up to 13,000 lines of, of, of code now. Um, it's now beyond, yeah, it's, it's, it's become a bit of a, um, it's no longer just my, my pet project. Um, and so, yeah, it really started in 2002, but we've been adding features to it until now, where I think it's now a, a fairly useful um, tool. But back then, we very quickly realized, or Peter very quickly real, realized, that we were going to have a problem um, in the computation. And so we built this, um, this cluster. It's actually, we basically bought 36 computers, took them out of the boxes. Um, this is actually not the first version. The very first version was set up in a lab on shelves. And as soon as we switched it on, it cut power to the whole floor. Uh, then we got a high, more power put into that room, but then even with cooling, it heated up the room so quickly, um, we had to find somewhere else. And I think that was really the catalyst for um, the physics department at Imperial College getting server um, rooms. But this cluster was, was essential. Um, it, what's interesting is, so for about £10,000 today, you can buy a, um, com, like a, a workstation which is in one box and significantly more powerful. But that, that was an important part of, of the research. And the first thing we actually did was to apply it to optical data storage. Um, so in 2003, because CDs, DVDs, and Blu-rays, they are just a microscope inside. Um, that there, there's nothing um, really much more to it than that. Um, so Blu-ray was being developed, and we were working with Philips, and we did some verification simulations. They have their own model. It doesn't really matter what... I mean, this, this, is, a, this is the profile of the disk, so that's a, what they call a land, and that's a pit, um, and it's representing um, binary information. So these were completely independent simulations. Um, I mean, what this really showed was that although our simulation was more rigorous than theirs, I think they, Phillips were pretty confident that um, this showed they didn't really need to do any more work. Um, so, but it was a useful verification for us because we then went on to working on an idea that um, Peter had, which we were just talking about today, actually, but this is what was called multiplexed optical data storage. Multiplexed optical data storage encodes numbers in the angle of these pits. So if you think of an hour hand, let's say representing 60 different 60 minutes, it's the angle of the sorry, the minute hand. It's the hour of it's, it's the angle of the minute hand, right? In the very same way the angle of these pits. There's lots of different angles, and each angle can encode a different number. So that enables us to encode much more information on a disk. Um, I, think, I think I can quote you, Peter, in saying, if things had been differently, we could be very wealthy today. Um, but, and I'll explain why in a minute, but so we, we did... Um, we used so the simulation was very important in the development. Um, we, we did experimental verification of it, um, and there is well, at least on at, at the points we would be sampling, there's a, there's a good agreement um, between the simulation and the experiment. And it this is I mean in terms of sort of media coverage, getting into the metro is you know that it, it doesn't really get much better than that. Um, so, yeah, we got, it, we got into the metro, and, I, and they quoted that um, we'd be a, a single layer of this disc would be able to um, put the Lord of the Rings trilogy 13 times over. I think we worked out we could have the, every ep Simpsons episode on one disc. Then, unfortunately, Netflix came along, um, and Peter and I had to look for alternative um, plans for making our fortune. Um, the, I think the patent has now lapsed. Um, so anyway, um, at that time, Peter, I'd, I had a PhD and postdoc with Peter, and Peter suggested it would be a good idea to get some experience elsewhere. Um, so <clears throat> I applied for a job um, with Sandro, who's, who's sat back there. 
Um, I got held up on the Piccadilly line. I was late arriving. Then the security um, guards didn't know the name of the, of the room that I'd been asked to go to. So I was really late for the interview, but thankfully managed to get the job. But the job, so X-ray, it, it, at least um, when, when, I, when I started this, it, it was relatively unknown or it was certainly relatively underused, the fact that X-rays are refracted. Okay, we normally think about X-rays being absorbed by the body, which is why bones show up in X-ray images. But they are actually refracted. The only problem is they're refracted by about one ten millionth of a degree, which is a very, very small amount. So it's hard to detect. But with this is actually quite late in the group, because um, actually when we started, it was just Sandro, me, Robert, and Constantine. So it was just four of us. Um, but Sandro had a great idea, and that was to create these little beams. So this might be, this opening here might be about 10 microns or so. Um, and to, to create these, these very small beams of X-rays, and then the X-rays will be refracted, may be refracted by the sample. And then because they're refracted, so this, this is where they would be detected. So we, it, the, in, the intensity or the detected, what, what the detector detects will actually, so the angle, the refraction angle will be converted into an intensity modulation. So we did a, my job was to essentially come up with mathematical models that would, that would describe this. And for a slight detour, um, there's a nice little symmetry to this because when I left, so I mentioned at the start I worked at Telstra. When I left Telstra, well, this is actually an image before I got there. You, you, if you looked closely, you could see by the cars. But that's roughly what it looked like. While I was away, this happened. Um, and then the next time I went back there, they'd actually built a synchrotron. So there was, because the, the labs, actually, I was, on, I was on leave without pay for a long time. And um, I found out that I could have actually been made redundant if I hadn't have resigned. Um, but yes, yeah, so, so the next time I went back, they had a synchrotron there. And although I've never done an experiment at this synchrotron, I've, I've only visited, synchrotronic <laughs> visits have been an important part of the time that I've been at UCL since 2008. And for those of you that haven't been to a synchrotron, they typically involve 18-hour shifts, four to five, you know, four to five times, um, or four to five days in a row. And there's a lot of working in the lab, which you can see Sandro setting up some equipment. You can see N here preparing samples, and this is the sort of the room that you sit in to control everything, and we never use that bed, but the evidence of a bed, I think, just suggests you the type of hours that people work. Um, I generally try to keep this part of it secret from my family, um, but somehow, I mean, amongst all that time, we do find time to, um, particularly when we go to Trieste, um, uh, and particularly in the summer month, but um, I know this particular adventure did come at a cost because we, we failed to get a result that I think we still kick ourselves about. But anyway, um, we did manage to go sailing. So back to the refraction. Essentially, I, you could think about it like this. I, I, was, I was developing um, like physics-based equations in order to convert the data that we recorded um, to bring this black line closer to the pink line, even though actually the pink line is, is, is probably not, um, it's probably not accurate, so it should probably be closer. But in, in the true sort of fashion of diminishing returns, so the black line was the very first attempt, um, but we had to work harder and harder and harder to get um, to understand, essentially, what this was, what we were doing, we were understanding what is what is going on in this imaging method that we don't understand. So there's the reason why the re why sometimes the results don't match um, what we expect is that there's some non-ideal factor in the system. Actually, since this work has been done, work is, is actually this has been has been surpassed by other um, members of the advanced X-ray imaging group. 
But it did lead to a bit of a high point, and that was publishing this work. Um, so the, what was unique about this work was that generally this type of imaging is done in a synchrotron. Um, synchrotrons, there's only a relatively small number in the world. Like there's one in the UK. Um, there's one in Australia. There's you know, a few um, in, in, in Europe um, outside of the UK. But they're very expensive, and you can only access them infrequently. But we could do this um, in, in a lab um, setting. So it makes it accessible um, much cheaper. So, but then um, it was, I was fortunate enough to receive funding from the um, Australian Research Council to be independent. So up until now, I had been working um, really for Sandro and for Peter, which was great, but it is um, an important step to have my own funding, and I managed, I got this funding and um, went to Perth. Obviously, you can see um, back at UWA on, on the river, um, this is, uh, I think the head of the group decided we should all walk out to this pontoon and have the photo. Um, it had certain impractical aspects, but it, it did make for a nice photo. Um, and so this is when I started to work on optical coherence tomography, or OCT for short. Um, OCT performs three-dimensional imaging, and it, it is the combination of a, I guess, of a confocal microscope, but it obtains depth information due to the time of flight um, of light. So light that is reflected off this part of the retina takes less time to travel in and out than light that reflects off that lower part of, of the retina. Um, it's often said to be the equivalent of ultrasound imaging but using light. Uh, so I think m people are generally more familiar with ultrasound. This is what a typical um, OCT system looks like. But the, the key, so coming, so the, this is really coming back to the, to the modeling, to the simulation. And the objective here is to simulate how the light propagates into a sample and how the light propagates out of a sample. And this is what a typical sample may, um, this is actually um, the structure of, of, of a mouse retina that uh, collaborators in Poland have, have recently obtained. And th this, is, this, is a, this is one of the best um, images of, of it's actually a refractive index image, if you're familiar with that concept, which is essentially telling us how quickly light travels. Um, so this is one of the most advanced images of this nature that, that we have currently. And so what does that mean? Well, so this is a, the profile of a beam that would propagate um, in free space if there's nothing there. Okay? But when we, in fact, have a retina, the retina causes that light to scatter. Okay, and the question is, well, what we want to understand is how does that light scattering affect the image um, and what, what, can we, what can we learn from that using computation? So, <clears throat> one, that's all very nice in principle, but, one, but the problem is that to do this simulation, we have to represent, so we, we have to take this, image of the retina, and we have, to rep we have to represent it by pixels. So just like on a smartphone, you have so many thousand by so many thousand pixels. Okay? An image is made up by individual pixels. And inside the computer, the, s the retina needs to be represented by pixels. And when I first started this, every pixel would need to be a wavelength about a 20th of a wavelength. Now, you don't really need to know what a wavelength is, but if you consider a wavelength to be one meter divided into a million parts, roughly, um, then it means that each of these cells would be 50 nanometers. So it could be a cube of, of 50 nanometers or a square of 50 nanometers. Now, what that means is that if I wanted to simulate so using the very first implementation, 
of TDMS, um, essentially we would need to have 300 gigabytes of um, computer memory, which is not, like, that's not unfeasible today. It was back in 2002. Like, I think we only had, we had 36 gigabytes and that was a big machine. But the real problem is an image would probably take a year or more to compute. So that, 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 that was the really big problem. So the question was, can we make these cells 10 times larger? So therefore reducing the whole computation and the memory requirement by a factor of 1,000. So i.e., can, can we make this tractable? The answer is we can, and I'll just give a little bit of an, of an explanation as to why. So um, t inside TDMS, it's, it's, cal it's calculating many derivatives. Now, who here, I want to see, every, uh, who remembers what a derivative is? I know many of you will know, but I'm curious, okay, I, can, I can see, because I, I look, I, I know many of you, uh, um, if you probably need to like resign if you didn't, but there are some ten. There are some ten-year-olds and twelve-year-olds in the audience. But so, but the, the derivative is the slope. Okay. Um, now, it's inside TDMS. It only has knowledge of these red dots. Okay. It doesn't know the blue line is is what what I know this wave to be. But TDMS only knows these dots, and so. But we can calculate the derivative just by taking the difference, essentially this difference B and this difference A, and dividing the two. And as the red dot, so as the sampling gets further apart and we have fewer sample points, it still works until we get down to this type of sampling where I've only got three dots here, um, and, but now the approximation is very poor. But what we can do as well is, so we can use Fourier theory. Now, for those of you that aren't familiar with Fourier theory, essentially what we know, because we know this is a wave, waves have, um, we can make use of the properties of waves, right? This, 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 we know this is going to move, this is going to vary smoothly, okay? And what that means is that by using Fourier theory, we can just with those three dots, we can generate these dots on the, um, of, of the derivative exactly. And actually, we can calculate them everywhere. So we have full knowledge. Now, I, I've chosen a nice case. So there, there are practical things that reduce the accuracy. But ultimately, it means that we can really significantly reduce the sampling um, and achieve what, what we need to achieve, which is lower computation. Which takes me back to actually 1997, um, because this, uh, this is Professor Ren Potts. Um, he, he, well, I'm not able to judge this, but I, I understand that he's one of Australia's, um, prim he's no longer alive, but he's one of Australia's premier mathematicians. Um, he was the inaugural chair of applied mathematics of the University of Adelaide. He also received the first um, Australian Mathematical Society medal. Um, he's also, well, he's my mum's uncle as well. Um, and, but he, in 1997, when I was doing a, an internship at the University of Adelaide, he, he actually introduced me to this concept of um, solving so difference equations, which calculate derivatives, but he showed me that you can actually cal um, you can calculate, there are ways of solving these equations um, exactly in a numerical way, um, which I didn't actually, basically it was only much later I, I remembered this and I thought, yeah, that is actually what I'm doing. So um, it, it, it was nice that I could come back to that. So putting it all together, so after a lot of coding, a lot of testing, um, a lot of discussions with people like Andrea, Brendan, and David um, in Perth, we, we, I got the first simulation. But because of this very, very good phantom that Andrea, um, Brendan, and David had made, phantom is, is an object that we know its properties. So we were able to 
compare simulation and experiment. I, I've only shown the very basic comparison. Um, I have to say the only reason why these don't look essentially identical is it's very hard to control exactly the properties of the phantom. But when we do a quantitative, um, I could show you a lot of different histograms and graphs, um, and the, the intrinsic signals, if, if you like, um, are very accurate for, in the simulation. Um, still, this took um, 192, well this, we didn't use a single computer, but if we did, it would have taken just under 200 days, so, um, which is why we've continued to develop ways to speed it up. Um, but nonetheless, we were able to prove the principle. Um, which was interesting, also interesting to me, because when I started, um, when I did my final year um, project when I was an undergraduate, I was developing an electromagnetic field solver to analyze high-speed digital communications. Um, whereas, and so that's really what got me on this journey. Um, but now I have a, basically I've just ended up I'm um, compounding the need for more high-speed communication. Right. Um, so I'm going to switch gears now because it's, it's been quite difficult for me to fit what I've been working on into something coherent. Um, but now I'm going to talk about something I've been working on more recently, which may, it does make use of all the simulation. But this is elastography. Elastography is important because diseased tissue often develops um, a, a different mechanical property to healthy tissue. So a, this image demonstrates, so if we take an OCT image of, of, of a sample, then we take another image, but this time we press down on the sample, what we expect is we expect the soft regions to compress more than the hard regions, okay? So if you think about that, it just in terms of, imagine if we had four springs here. The only difference is, is that this spring is stiffer than the other springs. If we apply downward load, um, we see this spring, this spring, and this spring, they all deform by more than this one, right? So what we see is that this spring becomes relatively shorter compared with this one because it's softer. And this relative change in length is, is, what, is, is what is called strain. Okay? So this spring is under much higher strain than this spring. And so strain actually gives us a way of sensing stiffness. Now, displacement measurement in, in OCT, um, which Andrea, who, who I'll mention in a bit, has spent um, his, essentially his whole PhD working on, turns out to be way more complicated than, than we thought it was. Um, an OCT image is really two images in one. So we don't, we generally only display this one, but um, it's, OCT images are generally referred to as having a magnitude and a phase. What that really means is there's, there's two images, okay? And the way that we measure displacement, so we can measure displacement um, down to probably tens of nanometers, but it's measured by looking at essentially, if we look at it from this perspective, it's the change in color. So you can see this feature here goes from red to blue because of the loading, and this feature here goes from blue to red. So it's not actually the movement of, of a feature. It's actually a change in the intrinsic signal that, that we're measuring. But it, there, there are complicated... And this is, this is the way that um, displacement has been detected um, in OCE, in optical coherence elastography, and other related technologies for quite a while. But there are complications, and those complications are... Well, there's quite a few of them, but it assumes that this structure, so let's say um, where like the patterns that you can see here, irrespective of the colour, it assumes that those patterns don't move and they stay the same, which we know doesn't happen. Okay? So here's, here's an example. This is, um, some, this is experimental data using, okay, it's called weight, it's strain retrieval, it's called weighted least squares fitting, it doesn't really matter but what that means. 
But that is the, one of the current ways. And all of this yellow banding, that is actually an artifact. So essentially, from this point down, the image is just artifact. Because the, the basic assumptions um, are not being um, met. So, and I, this is one of those moments when I can still remember um, the idea, because I was in Perth and I, I was having a discussion with Brendan Kennedy, who, who I've mentioned, and I, I, had, I had this idea, and I realized that, okay, and I, I, I will not be able to go through the maths, but I realized that beneath the surface of this image, there is a mathematical, there is essentially a mathematical transformation that transforms the unloaded into the loaded. Because we, we more or less know, um, we can describe the physics pretty well. And I realized if we can work out the transformation to go from the loaded, uh, that should actually say unloaded. But if we can go from the work out this transformation, then we actually have strain retrieval. We, we actually have solved the problem. Um, and we were able to do it. Um, it took considerable amount of time. And I really have to pay testament to um, Andrea, Balash, and Jakob, who worked in incredibly hard. And actually, we were so close to giving up on this. Um, it was just Balash, one Saturday afternoon, decided to just check the code one more time. Um, and so what we found is that, OK, this yellow, that is not a failure of our method. That is actually a failure of the, of the hardware. Um, we can't overcome that. Well, we, if we redesign the hardware, we can. But well, so what we know is that this method does outperform the existing method. The only problem is it's, it's quite slow. Um, so Andrea, um, who was already let's say, moving on, um, developed a, a method which uses um, convolutional neural networks, which um, is, a cent well, it, it, it's a form of AI. Um, and he's developed an even better method um, that, that, that has fewer artifacts, um, but also, crucially, is, is much, much faster. Because if we apply this to um, this is um, some excised human breast tissue because this technique is quite effective in looking at breast cancer tumor margins. Um, so it's, it, it, admittedly, it is hard to detect, but you can see, so that white is an artifact in, in the existing method, and we've, that artifact isn't present. There's also a lot of artifacts around this region that, that we've been able to remove. And if we were to zoom in, like there's new um, contrast or there's new details in that region. But the really important thing is that with, our, with the very first improved method, I think to calculate this image was taking um, a, around two weeks. Um, which if the, the whole idea of this method is that you could do this while the patient is, is on an operating table. So two weeks isn't going to work. Um, but Andrea's method is, is rapid, so it, it's able to, to do this better and faster. Um, so yeah, um, Andrea's done an, an exceptional job of, of really getting into this problem and solving it. Now, I am coming towards the end. I haven't been able to fit everything in, but I did want to point out um, that I was very um, fortunate to be able to work um, with Professor Paul Beard on the optical sensing of ultrasound. Um, and Dylan, who was a PhD student with Jamie and I, um, he developed a, the, the, the first really accurate model that had a, um, a, a very good agreement with, well, up until then we didn't have agreement with, ex with experiment, and he developed the model. Um, but I feel confident to say that he's, he's fully characterized the sensor. So this, this is using laser light to detect ultrasound, um, which is a very exciting um, imaging technique that is um, led by Paul Beard and, and others in the field. But um, yeah, Dylan really took it a long way um, and to the point where we've, we've been able to try different beam types to improve the sensor. But, and I think get a pretty good idea um, 
of what the, the ultimate, or what at least some of the ultimate limitations of the method are. So that, that was a really um, satisfying piece of work um, to be involved with. So now we really are coming into to the last couple of, like the last few slides. Back to ophthalmology, um, which this is one of my current, um, essentially I'm talking about current work now, something that I'm really enthusiastic about. So we want to solve this problem about understanding, for example, band two in an OCT rational image, which part of the retina does it actually relate to? Um, and so, but actually, um, it gets even more complex because um, Vivek Srinivasan, who is um, a collaborator based in New York, he has, he has a hypothesis, and it's backed up by a lot of data, that band two is actually two bands, band 2A and 2B. And so what we want to do is we want to develop a, a model that, well, hopefully proves his hypothesis or disproves it. Um, so, and this is the first simulation. I have to say, I mean, because this was only recently um, performed. This is on, on the mouse retina. I showed it anyway, but I know there's actually something. I know that we used an incorrect parameter on this simulation. So it, it's, 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 you're not really going to find anything of, of, you, of use out of this, but I just thought I'd show it anyway. Um, but, yeah, I essentially, so now we have a really um, nice... Uh, a really good team of, of people both in, our de in my department, um, in the Institute of Ophthalmology and um, at the Nicholas Copernicus Institute um, in, in Poland where we, we have really all the, the tools in place that we need to, to, build, you know, to build this model and, and learn new knowledge um, about the retina. So with that, so I would like to thank, now I'm, I'm re really, I've, I've spent quite a bit of time putting these together, Ho like, I'm hoping that I haven't forgotten anyone, but I really just did want to first thank the mentors and supervisors, so pretty much in chronological order, so Professor Peter Torek, PhD supervisor, um, Professor Manolis Creasis, who taught me a lot about the underpinning techniques used in TDMS, um, and then coming um, to UCL, Professor, uh, Professor Sandro Olivo, um, who really, um, you know, took my career from, from just, you know, from postdoc on to being independent. Um, Professor Jem Hebden, who was my head of department. Um, Professor Paul Beard, who gave me a great opportunity to work um, on, on the census that he developed and Professor Andy Nisbet, who is my current head of department, and Professor David Sampson, whose group I worked in in Perth. Um, I'd like to thank um, the past and present members of my group. I won't, I won't name them all. Um, I have tried to, you know, to, to name them dur during the presentation where possible. Um, there's a, a long list here uh, of, of people that I work with. But I will just highlight a few. Firstly, Naomi, who I believe most of you will know at least by name, um, who, who has organised today. So thank you, Naomi. I can't actually see where you are, but thank you. Um, I'd like to thank um, Professor Marinko Sarunic, who has helped to um, introduce me to ophthalmic imaging, which is, is very exciting. Um, Andrea, who actually was a PhD student of mine, but now has his own independent um, position. Um, Jamie Guggenheim, um, who we, before he went to University of Birmingham, we worked a lot together um, sp um, specifically on the ultrasound um, sensing. Professor Maciej Wojkowski, who's always, who's um, based in um, Warsaw, has, has always been really helpful to me. Um, Pavel, we did a lot of work together on applications of TDMS. Um, Brendan, who has, over the years, we had adjacent offices in Perth and spent a lot of time talking about science and, and other things. And then the, the sort of the people from the Advanced X-ray Imaging Group, who I work really closely with, Marco, Charlotta, Sylvia, 
um, and, and Ian. This is not the whole group, but I've just named the people that I've worked with over a long period of time. So, finally, the, what I'd call the key collaborator acknowledgements. Um, I haven't put everyone here, but um, to my lovely wife, Jo, who... Um, it ought not to be this way, um, and as Vice Dean, I'm trying to get away, f you know, we're trying to do what we can, but Joe has had to make sacrifices to support my career. That's a fact. I'm not saying that, that all women should do that. Um, and that, you know, we have lots of women um, in our faculty, and we need to support those women. But Joe actually has done that for me, and I, I, I wouldn't be here um, if Joe hadn't have done that. My, um, to my kids who, when they were younger, were an, well, we might have called them anti-collaborators, but now definitely they're on, the, on that collaborator side. Um, Mum and Dad, who um, of course have, you know, support, like, have supported me, and I, I guess looking back, my, my sense of, say, being here today is one of uh, like, immense privilege. Like, we don't realise how... Well, I mean, I certainly do, but especially as I try to broaden, um, you know, the, the membership of our faculty, um, the things that we take for granted are, are, are amazing. And just, yeah, so mum and dad, essentially it was, let's say, it felt sort of easy to, to progress from one step to another because I was given those early opportunities. Um, so my, um, my, my mother-in-law, Anna, who sadly passed away a few years ago, um, but I would like to acknowledge her. But my father-in-law, Chris, is, is still with us. Um, and, and without... So essentially, um, Anna and Chris give a lot of help to us, um, as you can imagine. Um, we need help with the kids and the family in general. So they are an immense... They have been an immense support to us. Um, so, uh, yes, I, I absolutely couldn't have done this... Um, without them, and yeah, and um, thank you to everybody here. Um, I'm glad to see no one's, you know, decided it's got too much for them. Um, so, and finally, of course this can't be done without funding, and um, especially, well, the Royal Society has been a very um, big supporter of me. Uh, they essentially have made this possible. Um, I know there's other people in the room who've, who've benefited. Um, from the Royal Society too, so I, I really thank the Royal Society, but of course um, all of the you know all of the other funders as well. So that is the end of my talk. I hope you know a little bit more about imaging now, and I hope yeah, I hope um, that's given you some enthusiasm for imaging. So thank you for your attention. Thank you, Peter. I, I've been given the honour of uh, giving a vote of thanks for for Peter's excellent uh, lecture. And I also got to thank Peter and his family for letting me share lunch with them today. And I, 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 I was very fortunate to, to sit next to his parents at lunch and I thought it might be an opportunity to see if I could eke out a, an embarrassing anecdote to drop into my, my vote of thanks today about his childhood. It turns out he was uh, almost a perfect child, and, uh, and there was really not really uh, much gossip that I, I was able to get out about his childhood. In fact, his father, Robert, did say that, uh, I, I said, what were his interests as a child? He said, well, he was interested in cricket and sport, but really, he liked thinking. And I thought, well, that's the Peter I know. He's someone who likes thinking, and that is the pleasure that I get from, from Peter's company is he's someone who does enjoy thinking. He's someone you can go to with a problem which might be not in his immediate uh, sphere of research, and he enjoys thinking about it. And he has a, a remarkable capacity to formulate uh, a problem in a, a tractable way that might help me or others to, to go about getting a solution. And his ability to communicate that is also quite remarkable, and we've, we've seen that today in his lecture. I'd also like to thank Peter for being just a fabulous academic, as well as a good researcher. He's, he's a very dedicated and able teacher, and we know of his uh, contributions to the wider department, to the faculty, as, as, uh, as um, evidenced by his current post as, as Vice Dean for Research, which is a very big and important post. And uh, also, I'd like to thank Peter for being one of the most likable, 
people I've ever met in my life. And he's a pleasure to be around, and uh, he's just an all-around great bloke. So, so let, let's all put our hands together to thank him for his uh, excellent lecture today. And immediately after this, if you'd like to go down to the... Well, follow someone down to the, um, the South Cloisters, where there is going to be a drinks reception. So, hands together now to thank Peter for his lecture.